In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> Today I will make some comments on the recent excommunication of Archbishop Viganò. Years ago, when I was a Novus Ordo seminarian, Archbishop Viganò came to our seminary for a visit. At that time, he was Apostolic Nuncio to the United States. Nuncio is the official title for Vatican ambassador to a foreign country. And one of the things that nuncios are expected to do is to tour the seminaries of that country to communicate messages from the Pope and to report back to the Pope about the conditions of seminaries. And so here he was celebrating Novus Ordo Mass. He preached a short sermon in English. And afterwards, the seminarians, including myself, greeted him one by one in the vestibule. I am sure he does not remember me, but I remember him. In my mind, it was just another day in Novus Ordo Seminary. Little did I know at that time that he would achieve the kind of celebrity status in the media that he has today. Now, at that time, Ratzinger had recently removed him from his position as Secretary General of Vatican City State and had sent him off to America. While here in this country, the Archbishop had the opportunity to get to know the Novus Ordo bishops of this country, and at the center of this group of men was Theodore McCarrick, the now disgraced former Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C. Anyone in the Novus Ordo clergy who had heard about McCarrick knew about his penchant for filthy and unnatural crimes with young men. Even I, who was only a seminarian at that time, had heard from priests about the notorious beach house, the predatory behavior, even detailed physical characteristics of the victims he preferred and did not prefer the color of their eyes, the color of their hair, the nicknames he gave them, and the nicknames that they gave him. I heard over and over from Novus Ordo priests who loved to gossip and giggle about these things like silly schoolgirls, as if they were not serious matters. Archbishop Viganò was surprised to see this monster still active as it was his understanding that Ratzinger had prohibited him from public activity. He began to make some inquiries, but these ended nowhere because Ratzinger's restrictions lacked proportionate seriousness compared to the gravity of the crimes committed. They amounted to little more than a private notification known only to McCarrick and a few others. They were entirely dependent on the goodwill of McCarrick, his willingness to cooperate. Since he was unwilling to cooperate, and since Ratzinger was unwilling to be firm in enforcing the restrictions, in the practical order it was as if they did not exist. Archbishop Viganò retired in 2016 and was not heard from again until 2018. That year, the Archdiocese of New York reported that certain allegations that McCarrick had committed crimes against children were credible and substantiated. After this report, the Vatican then publicly prohibited McCarrick from public activity. Now, as if this news were not explosive enough, about a month later, Archbishop Viganò virtually <coughs> lit the internet on fire with a dossier accusing Bergoglio of having had knowledge about McCarrick long before the allegations from New York were made public. He claimed not only did Bergoglio ignore McCarrick's sordid history, but actually rewarded McCarrick by giving him positions of power. <coughs> Archbishop Viganò ended the bombshell dossier by stating that the only respectable thing for Bergoglio to do is to resign. Journalists asked Bergoglio to react to the dossier 
but he did not respond except to call Archbishop Vigano an agent of Satan. To this day, Bergoglio has still not responded. Shortly afterward, it came to light that the Vatican had been receiving reports about McCarrick's unnatural interest in children as far back as the 1990s. In 2002, the bishops of the United States appointed him to oversee the official Novus Ordo program for the protection of children, despite his history of predatory behavior being well known to them. Then it was revealed that the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., Cardinal Wuerl, a close friend of McCarrick and one of the most influential men in the Novus Ordo hierarchy, was involved in the cover-up of crimes of the same nature throughout his career and lied about his involvement in them. He then resigned in disgrace. Cardinal Ouellette of Montreal, the head of the Congregation of Bishops, made a statement denouncing Archbishop Vigano, but the statement also conceded all the main points of the Archbishop's dossier to be true. Therefore, it backfired against the author and actually strengthened Archbishop Vigano's statement. From that time until today, Archbishop Vigano has not been in communion with the Novus Ordo hierarchy. He went into a kind of hiding, a self-imposed exile, and he began to regard the Novus Ordo clergy as his enemies, the enemies of the church, instead of fellow shepherds of the flock of Christ. This was really the moment that a schism was opened up, a division between himself and them. And it was the beginning of his road to sedevacantism. For the next several years, he continued to publish letters in which it was clear that he was struggling to make sense of what was happening in the church. He searched and searched for answers and eventually started to focus on the traditional movement. Just recently, he declared in writing that Bergoglio is certainly not the pontiff of the Catholic Church and has no authority over the Church. He has no authority to judge him. He also said that Vatican II is not consistent with the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Bergoglio then excommunicated him for the crime of schism. The story of Archbishop Vigano is something that resonates with me personally because I too was excommunicated by the Novus Ordo for the same crime, and my story is very similar. There came a moment in my Novus Ordo priesthood, quite early actually, within a few months after my ordination, when I realized that I could not in good conscience continue to associate myself familiarly with Novus Ordo clergy as if I was one of them. The more you get to know them, the more you realize that you are dealing with a wicked group of people. I actually remember making a resolution early in my career to cut off communication with all Novus Ordo clergy except for a few trusted friends. I stopped going to clergy gatherings and retreats and resolved to depart from the diocese as soon as possible. This was the moment when I began no longer to be in communion with the Novus Ordo clergy, but at the time I did not know where to go. I wanted to go somewhere where I would never have to deal with the Novus Ordo or Vatican II ever again. I knew that these were the sources of all the problems in the church. And like Archbishop Vigano, I did a lot of research to try to determine the right course of action. In my spare time, I read Archbishop Lefebvre, Romano Amerio, Christopher Ferrara, Michael Davies, and other authors, and as a result, for a time, I fell under the spell of recognize and resist. I tried to carve out a niche for myself within the diocese where I could try to shelter myself from the influence of the Novus Ordo and from Vatican II. 
However, the spell of recognize and resist was eventually broken, and I am completely convinced that it was broken by the prayers of the saints that I had enlisted to be my advocates, to whom I will be always grateful. At that time, I decided to take a week-long silent retreat, and I brought along with me some things to read, which persuaded me that the set of Acantus position was correct. They were the Vatican Council of 1870, St. Robert Bellarmin on the Church, St. Francis de Sales' apologetic works against Protestantism, and the magisterial teachings against liberalism and modernism from the time of Pope Gregory XVI to Pope Pius XII. When I returned from this retreat, I met His Excellency Bishop Sanborn and resolved to go to Most Holy Trinity Seminary. Then I called the bishop of my own diocese, informing him of my theological position and of my desire to resign immediately. To support my position, I sent him the teachings of the magisterium condemning the errors of Vatican II. He invited me to his house to discuss the matter in person, but I declined. Part of me thought he would accept my resignation and allow me to quietly disappear. After all, Vatican II is all about accompaniment, journeying with those of different beliefs, gathering together as one, affirming unity in diversity, and so on. Part of me thought that he would say, I hope you follow your dreams and find your happiness. But that is not how he reacted. He excommunicated me for the crime of schism less than 24 hours later. In the decree of excommunication, he said that he consulted the Congregation for Clergy in Rome regarding my position as a sedevacantist. He said that my behavior was, quote, inconsistent with the life expected of a baptized Roman Catholic, and that the excommunication was intended to call me to conversion and repentance. There were nuns at my parish who dabbled in soothsaying, and that was never described as inconsistent with the life expected of a Roman Catholic. There was a priest who lived near me who published a book explicitly denying the perpetual virginity of our Blessed Mother, and he was never called to conversion or repentance. I witnessed many far worse things during my time in the Novus Ordo, which modesty prevents me from recounting from the pulpit due to the presence of children, none of which was ever described as inconsistent with the life expected of a Roman Catholic. You see, anything goes in the Novus Ordo except criticism of Vatican II. You can criticize any other council you want, any other papal teaching or teaching of a saint. You are even free to ridicule the saints or the apostles or sacred scripture if you feel like it, and you can behave in as immoral and blasphemous a manner as you like, down to the very depths of the cesspool of human depravity. But you cannot criticize Vatican II. That is the one thing upon which their pride will not permit them to suffer any attack. They do not even really believe in the substance of the teachings of Vatican II. To really follow the errors of Vatican II to their logical conclusion, would be to renounce the very meanings of words entirely and to reduce all human thought to an exercise in futility. But they are not interested in truth, substance, logic, conclusions. They are interested in destroying the church. Vatican II for them is nothing more than a symbol of their loyalty to the great apostasy of John and Paul. Roncalli and Montini. These two men continue to be their cult leaders, whom they worship and adore as if gods. It is they who are the true schismatic sect, they who have truly excommunicated themselves, broken communion with the divine head of the church, our blessed Lord in heaven, and all the apostles, popes, saints, and bishops in all of history. They are a cult of worldliness in which everyone must, must march to the drumbeat of their own errors and sins, renouncing the Catholic religion 
in favor of this revolutionary new religion of the 1960s, and those who do not march to that drumbeat must be cast out. Their undying purpose in life truly is to crush every last remnant of genuine Catholicism from the face of the earth. They are like parasites that feed off the good reputation of the Catholic Church, while at the same time infecting it with the diseases of their heresies and wickedness. They say, Lord, Lord, but they do not do the will of the Father in heaven. To Archbishop Viganò, I would say two things. Firstly, I would like to offer him my congratulations. It is a badge of honor to be officially recognized, formally recognized, as an enemy of the modernists. The good Archbishop has taken an extremely important step, and I hope that other Novus Ordo prelates are inspired to follow his good example by divesting themselves of communion with them. Second, I would say Archbishop Viganò is not alone. He is a member of the Catholic Church which still has faithful bishops, priests, religious, and laity carrying out the apostolate that our Lord entrusted to her from the very beginning, all in spite of the present crisis. He ought not to think that the present crisis requires him to bury himself in isolation. There are friends to whom he can turn, who teach and who live the Catholic faith, and it is an honor to be among the first to extend to him the open hand of friendship. As for us, we ought to keep the Archbishop in our prayers. We ought to have masses offered for him. We ought to pray also for all of those who share his position, but who perhaps lack the courage to make a clean break from the Novus Ordo. Breaking away is necessary, but it is also difficult. To those who are contemplating it, I can assure them from experience that it is the best thing that you can possibly do for your own spiritual welfare and that of your whole family, and you will never regret it. God cannot fail to reward those who submit to temporal difficulties for the sake of spiritual goods. In the collect for Mass today, the Church declares that the providence of God never fails to set things in order by removing what is harmful to us and granting what is to our benefit. May all of us who are fighting this battle for the welfare of the Church be strengthened by the pledge of this divine providence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.